I have no disclosures on this talk. So it was back in the 1990s that the first guidelines were written for the management of patients with valvular heart disease because up till then, the management was all dependent upon what you were taught by your consultant or your attending when you were on rounds as a cardiology fellow or as a young attending. It then was revamped in 2006, revamped again in 2014, and fortunately now we have the 2020 ACCHA guideline for the management of patients with valvular heart disease. Now, what's new and what's changed in the management that's going to be very important for your practice? Number one is going to be the indications for intervention, and number two will be the type of intervention, and at the very end, we'll give you a little potpourri of some of the important practical clinical aspects that have changed. But overall, let's talk about the indication for intervention, and let's start with aortic stenosis, since that is one of the most common valvular heart diseases that you'll see today. Now, this is that very familiar natural history slide of aortic stenosis by Ross and Brownwald that was put together way back in the 1960s. And at that time, we had the old-fashioned mechanical valve prostheses, and we had the old-fashioned tissue bovine or pericardial prostheses. There was a high operative risk in the early days with aortic valve replacement. And these type of valves had a lot of complications. At 10 to 15 years, there was a 50% chance of an embolic event or a bleed with a mechanical valve. At 10 years, about 50% of the tissue valves would degenerate. Now, whenever we think about when to intervene on a patient with valvular heart disease, you have to weigh the risk of the operation versus the risk of the observation. The risk of the operation, of course, is the consequences of the operative intervention, as well as what happens long-term with the different type of valves. The risk of observation is the consequence of untreated valvular heart disease. And back in the 1980s and early 1990s, we thought it was primarily to treat heart failure and to improve mortality. So, Back in the early initial guidelines, the indication for operation with aortic stenosis would be the onset of symptoms or the drop in ejection fraction because we felt that the drop in ejection fraction would be when that increase afterload is overwhelming the left ventricle. However, since then, there have been a number of studies which have shown which have looked at the natural history of these patients who did not have symptoms, whose ventricular function remained normal. And patients with severe asymptomatic aortic stenosis still have a poor outlook if left untreated. At five years, about three out of four patients will have developed heart failure or died. So it was clear that if we waited for symptoms to occur, or waited for ventricular dysfunction to occur, we were waiting too long. Now the new paradigm kind of looks at the stages of aortic stenosis in this way. There'll be a time when you'll develop the mild to moderate stenosis and it could go on for years or decades or decades. At some point in time, the stenosis becomes severe once it becomes severe, there's the pressure overload on the ventricle, and you'll develop compensatory hypertrophy. And it used to be then we would wait for the drop in ejection fraction, which we knew would decrease survival, or the onset of symptoms, which would decrease survival even further. But there is a part that was missing there. And the part that was missing is that before the drop in ejection fraction or before the onset of symptoms, there was actually the development of myocardial damage. The compensatory hypertrophy itself could go on for years to normalize the wall stress, but during that time, myocardial damage would occur. Now, that myocardial damage would first start with extracellular matrix changes in which the collagen would be increased there. It would then develop a reactive fibrosis, 
both of those would be reversible. But then you would develop replacement fibrosis, which would be a true scar of the myocardium, and myocardial function would start to diminish. Now, this has subsequently been looked at with strain imaging on echocardiography. But most recently, looking at the MRI scan with the gadolinium enhancement defects, you would be able to see the extracellular matrix changes, the reactive fibrosis, and finally the replacement fibrosis, or the true scar. And it's been shown with a number of recent studies that the mortality doubles if a person develops gadolinium enhancement defects, even if they maintain normal systolic function of their left ventricle as assessed by the ejection fraction and remain asymptomatic. So let's go over this kind of stepped approach as to what happens with patients with aortic stenosis. Here's survival versus time. And what I would really propose that you do is start to use the stages of valvular heart disease that have been proposed in the guidelines to put your own patient into the different categories. So stage B we define as patients who has only mild to moderate stenosis and an aortic stenosis it's a gradient less than 40 or a valve area greater than one centimeter squared. At some point in time, they'll then develop severe stenosis and the stage B, which was mild to moderate stenosis, should now go into stage C1. C1 means that they remain asymptomatic, they develop severe stenosis, but now they're starting to develop compensatory hypertrophy and at some point in time, myocardial damage. Stage C2 is the time when they still remain asymptomatic, they have severe stenosis, but their ejection fraction starts to drop. And stage D is when they start to develop symptoms. And we knew from our old studies that in stage B we would follow in stage C2 would be an indication that you would intervene, and definitely in stage D, once they become symptomatic, you would intervene. But let's look a little bit further at this whole stage C1. In other words, the patients develop severe stenosis, number one. Number two, they remain asymptomatic. And number three, their ejection fraction, which is the way that we look at systolic function, remains normal. Now, the new paradigm is that there is now a change in the risk of the operation. In other words, if you have a patient with severe aortic stenosis going to a very good surgical um, uh, uh, center, the operative risk of an isolated surgical aortic valve replacement is less than 1%. And once the valves get replaced with the newer generation mechanical prosthesis and tissue prosthesis, the complication rate is much, much less than it used to be. Embolic events, bleeding are less than 1% per year. And the tissue valves themselves have a much greater longevity. And then finally, there's the TAVI, which we'll be talking about a little bit later, which would further decrease any operative risk of a patient with isolated aortic stenosis. So with that in mind, weighing the risks and risks of the procedure versus the benefit of the procedure, let's look more closely at stage C1. And what we want to do is we want to try to find that point before myocardial damage occurs, when the stenosis is severe and they remain asymptomatic. And there's a number of studies that have come out to show that other parameters such as a drop in blood pressure on the treadmill, or the presence of very severe aortic stenosis with a gradient greater than 60, or let's say you're following your BNP and it's up three times normal, or let's say you're following the ejection fraction and even though it remains normal over 50%, there's a progressive drop over three sequential studies to less than 60%. That's a bad prognosis. And those patients who have a rapid progression of aortic valve velocities greater than 0.3 meter per year are all parameters which are telling you that, yes, myocardial damage is just starting to occur. So with that in mind, the indication for intervention 
has been lowered. The threshold has been lowered. Class one, again, are patients with severe aortic stenosis who develop symptoms or whose ejection fraction has fallen less than 50%. S class 2A is the very severe aortic stenosis in the asymptomatic patient, positive treadmill, high BNP, rapid progression, or progressive drop in ejection fraction to still normal, but a drop to less than 60%. And pretty soon, we'll have more prognostic information from our other studies, such as strain pattern on the uh, echocardiography or gadolinium enhancement defects on MRI scan, which will again be able to tell us that these patients are starting to develop that irreversible myocardial fibrosis, and we should intervene earlier rather than later, especially if they're at low risk for intervention. So that's aortic stenosis. Clearly a change in the way that we look on the patient, knowing we operate for symptoms, knowing we operate for a ejection fraction less than 50%, but now our threshold is lower and lower and lower, and some of these other parameters are telling us, yes, that in the low-risk patient, it indeed is a very fruitful decision to make to operate earlier rather than later when some of these other parameters are indicating this insidious left ventricular interstitial fibrosis that develops. Now let's just turn to mitral regurgitation. We'll talk about primary mitral regurgitation here, which is a disease of the valve itself and the indication for intervention. And again, we're going to go to this paradigm shift where we're looking at survival versus time in which you start with mild to moderate regurgitation, develop severe. Instead of compensatory hypertrophy with mitral regurgitation being a volume overload, there's compensatory dilatation. Then there's that myocardial damage that occurs. Following that, there's a drop in ejection fraction and following that, their symptoms. And each time you go further and further, your survival is going to get lower and lower. Now, what we've known is that we're going to use the effective regurgitant orifice to determine whether or not a valve is mild to moderate or valve regurgitation is severe. And an ERO greater than 0.4 centimeters squared is a good quote, cutoff to determine whether or not there's enough volume overload to cause a problem. Compensatory hypertrophy or left ventricular enlargement will occur, drop in ejection fraction. We know from the outcome studies that if your ejection fraction is less than 60% or your end systolic dimension, which is a beautiful measurement of both the size of the ventricle as well as its ventricular contractility is greater than 40 millimeter, that constitutes a visible drop in ejection fraction. And then the symptoms of mitral regurgitation, of course, are angina, dyspnea, or syncope. Now, we will put those patients with mitral regurgitation again into the different stages, stage B, stage C1, stage C2, and stage D. And if it's stage B, we're gonna follow them. If it's stage C2, where their ejection fraction is dropped or their end systolic dimension is increased, we're going to intervene with a mitral valve operation. And of course, if they're symptomatic and severe stage D, we're going to intervene with a mitral valve operation. But the different thing about mitral regurgitation is this stage C1. And as opposed to aortic stenosis, this myocardial damage is unpredictable in patients with mitral regurgitation, and they develop scarring and interstitial fibrosis at any time. And there really are no parameters to tell us that indeed this myocardial damage is occurring. So we've been in a quandary as to when to operate on a patient with mitral regurgitation who remains asymptomatic, whose ventricular function remains greater than 60%, and end systolic dimension is less than 40 millimeter. But what has happened over the past two decades is that the intervention for primary mitral regurgitation has completely changed the way we look at things. Mitral valve repair for primary mitral regurgitation 
can be done in experienced sensors with an operative risk of many times less than 1%. And if you know the valve can be repaired, there's excellent long-term outcome. If you have a patient who is in that stage C1, has a successful mitral valve repair, their overall survival is comparable to a normal population without any heart disease. We also know that if we look at cohort series, that the survival with early surgery is going to be better than the survival with watchful waiting, primarily due to the fact that by waiting, you're always taking the chance that you're developing that irreversible myocardial dysfunction. Now, this does require a new concept, and the concept is that of a comprehensive valve center. And that valve center has to have enough experience with their surgeons to be able to achieve a durable and successful repair with a very low operative risk. And we do know that there are surgeons who do hundreds of these per year, and they're success rate for a repair is superb, greater than 90 or 95%. But there are a number of surgeons who do fewer than 10 to 15 mitral valve surgeries per year, and their repair rate is much, much less. So what has been proposed is this con concept of having comprehensive valve centers with the high experience to be able to successfully repair a valve with a high degree of success and a low operative risk. And if you have a patient then who has primary mitral regurgitation and have the surgical expertise to have a successful repair, we then weigh the risk of the operation, which would be very, very low, versus the risk of observation. And as I said, in mitral regurgitation, there's these disastrous consequences of long-standing volume overload. And if we know that your surgeon can successfully repair the valve with a greater than 90 to 95% certainty and a risk than less than 1%, well, then it is the severe mitral regurgitation itself, which would be an indication for intervention. So for primary mitral regurgitation, class one, remember, well, if they develop symptoms, they need something done. If their ejection fraction is less than 60% or their end systolic dimension is greater than 40 millimeter, the class C2, they should have something done irrespective of whether or not the valve can be repaired or needs to be replaced. But if you have these patients in class C1 who are asymptomatic, whose ventricular function remains normal, who's not all that dilated, but it truly is severe mitral regurgitation, and you know that your surgeon can do a durable repair with a high probability of success at a low operative risk, that in itself should push you to operate earlier rather than later to prevent the adverse consequences of the long-standing volume overload. So what has changed, and, and, and this has been a progressive change over the past decade, is the indication for intervention used to be just to improve symptoms or try to decrease mortality. But now we have a lower threshold to intervene before the onset of left ventricular dysfunction if the operation can be done at a low risk and a great outcome. So that's the major thing that's changed on the management of patients for valvular heart disease. Now, the type of intervention has also changed because what we have now is TAVI. And I think all of us who've seen this for the first time years ago knew that this would be a dramatic change in the way that we look on valvular heart disease. Because by inflating this balloon, expanding the valve, there's a dramatic relief of the obstruction within seconds, comparable to that of an aortic valve replacement. Now, when TAVIA first came out, all of the recommendations were based upon randomized trials. And our first trials showed that 
In inoperable patients, TAVI was better than medical therapy. In high-risk patients, TAVI was comparable to surgical aortic valve replacement. So the first guidelines that mentioned TAVI about six years ago said that, well, we should do TAVI in the inoperable patient and kind of have a shared decision-making in the high-risk patient, but reserve surgical aortic valve replacement to the low intermediate risk patient. Remembering, of course, that there's that group at the far right um, who are futile, who might not have a lifespan greater than one year in which we probably would not want to do anything. Well, the trials then became more and more um, significant by enrolling lower and lower risk patients. And soon there were several trials of intermediate risk patients in which TAVI, the results of TAVI, equaled that of surgical aortic valve replacement. So in our 2017 guidelines, it was that shared decision making in the intermediate and high risk patients. But now in 2020, we not only have trials that show comparability between TAVI and Saverin intermediate risk patients, but is extended to low risk patients. So what you have now is a shared decision making in lower intermediate risk patients for Saver versus TAVI. Now, we need to remember a few things as we start to apply this though, is that we also have to remember that mechanical valves do never wear out and thus there is a survival benefit of a mechanical versus a tissue valve in the younger patient. And a mechanical valve has to be put in with surgical aortic valve replacement. And if we take a look at some of the data, what we've come up with is that in patients who are about 50 or 55 or less, a mechanical is probably better than a tissue valve in terms of overall survival because tissue valves will wear out by 10 to 15 to 18 years. Over the age of 65 or 70, a tissue valve is very appropriate because that kind of represents the lifespan of the patient equaling the lifespan of the tissue valve. And in those patients between 50 and 70, it's a shared decision-making process with the patient as to whether or not they want a mechanical valve that doesn't wear out, uh, but requires open heart surgery and long-term anticoagulation versus a tissue valve, which could be TAVR or SAVI in some instances. Now, if they choose to have a tissue valve, we have to remember there's no data on TAVI for patients less than 65 years old. All of the randomized trials have been in the older patients, average age of about 70 to 75 years old and it's only been studied for symptomatic patients. So if you're gonna uh, do one of those 2A indications where they're asymptomatic and have had a drop in ejection fraction to less than 60% or a drop in blood pressure on treadmill, you should have a surgical aortic valve replacement. But in those patients who are symptomatic or whose EF has dropped to less than 50%, in patients who have chosen a tissue valve Again, we're gonna look at the ages. So we're not looking at risks anymore, we're gonna look at the ages. And again, less than 65, no data on TAVI. We don't know the long-term outcome on TAVI. They would go with the surgical aortic valve replacement. Age 75 or above, I think TAVI would be very, very reasonable. And those patients in between should have a shared decision-making process. Remembering that there are other factors which would preclude TAVI, such as concomitant aortic disease, they might need an aortic replacement. If they have severe CAD, they might be better off with a coronary bypass grafting and the lima to that LAD. If they have severe other valve disease, they're better with a surgical approach. If they have left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, they're better with a myectomy and a surgical aortic valve replacement versus a TAVI. And remember, there's anatomic reasons why a SAVR would be indicated for a TAVI, such as low-lying coronary ostea, a lot of calcification in the outflow tract or a bicuspid valve. So overall, let's kind of put this together and, and, and kind of go in a stepwise approach. What would we recommend to patients who are candidates for aortic valve intervention in 2021? 
If an aortic valve is indicated, the first thing to look at is the risk of the procedure. And I think in the high-risk patients, TAVI would certainly be an appropriate choice over surgical aortic valve. If they're an acceptable operative risk, we then look and see what patients might benefit in terms of longevity from mechanical surgical aortic valve replacement. And those are the younger patients um, whose lifespan would be much, much higher than the lifespan of the tissue valve. There's also this shared decision-making and patients need to determine whether or not they're willing to have another intervention or whether they're willing to take long-term anticoagulation, so on and so forth. Now, if they do choose a tissue valve, then it's a decision as to whether or not you go with a surgical tissue valve or a TAVI. And again, the age is important. So over 75, probably TAVI. Less than 65, remember we have no data on TAVI, so it'd be surgical. And those in between should be a shared decision-making process, remembering that there are instances where surgery would be better for other concomitant comorbidities or operations or anatomic reasons. So what has changed in the management of valvular heart disease in our newest guidelines? Number one is the indication for intervention. Remember, we want to have a lower and lower threshold to prevent the long-term adverse consequences on the left ventricle and the type of intervention now that we have the catheter-based interventions. So it's a lower threshold before the onset of left ventricular dysfunction and catheter-based interventions in selected patients. Now let's take the last few minutes to talk about some specific, let's say practical aspects that we want you to understand as you manage your patients. Let's first go to infective endocarditis prophylaxis. Now I'll let you think about which of these patients should have infective endocarditis prophylaxis? A patient with a mechanical valve for screening colonoscopy, a past mitral valve repair for dental cleaning, or a bicuspid valve for tooth removal? And the answer here is that the IE prophylaxis now is prescribed only for dental procedures which involve the mucosa and only for prosthetic valves or prosthetic material, including clips and rings, so previous mitral valve repair is indicated, or prior infective endocarditis. So that's been changing, and we've, again, been decreasing the number of instances where we're going to recommend infective endocarditis prophylaxis. Let's take another area here. A patient has a bioprosthetic valve three years ago and now has new onset of atrial fibrillation with a high CHAD score. What's the optimal treatment to prevent embolic events? Add apixaban, add warfarin, add ticagrelor. And what the new guidelines have said is that NOAX now can be used for treatment of atrial fibrillation based upon the CHADS2 VAST score with bioprosthetic valves if they were placed greater than three months ago. And we reserve warfarin then for those who have mechanical valves or rheumatic mitral stenosis. Another area, class three heart failure following an inferior myocardial infarction severe ischemic mitral regurgitation, ejection fraction down, end systolic dimension up on guideline-directed medical therapy. What's the appropriate treatment for his heart failure? And it's a transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair, surgical mitral repair, surgical mitral replacement. And based on some randomized trials, we now are recommending the mitral clip for secondary mitral regurgitation for patients with severe symptoms unresponsive to optimal medical therapy if their ejection fraction is down and their end systolic dimension is less than 70. Another case we want you to be aware of, the 72-year-old woman, three years after a pacemaker in atrial fibrillation now has severe right heart failure and she's got these very, very high V waves in her neck. Her ejection fraction is normal and her pulmonary pressure is normal. What's the optimal approach? Add an ACE inhibitor, an aldosterone antagonist, tricuspid valve operation, or sildenafil therapy. Well, we want you to know that there's recognition now of isolated severe tricuspid regurgitation, usually associated with atrial fibrillation or permanent pacemaker. And these patients actually respond to surgical treatment 
if unresponsive to diuretics. Finally, we've got this patient with mixed valve disease, moderate AS, moderate AR, class two symptoms, what's the best approach? And based on data from our institution at Mayo, the indication for mixed aortic valve disease is to be able to apply the same criteria for isolated aortic stenosis. And we treat mixed aortic valve disease the same way we would treat severe aortic stenosis if the greater is greater than 40 millimeter of mercury. Finally, one last thing, healthy man has a surgical aortic valve replacement with a mechanical St. Jude's prosthesis, normal coronary arteries, what is the optimal anticoagulation management? This is a change from what we've had in the past, warfarin and aspirin, warfarin or apixaban. For patients with a mechanical saver or mitral valve replacement, you do not need to add an aspirin unless it's indicated for other reasons. So these patients can be managed on the warfarin alone. So what's changed in the management of valvular heart disease? The overall concept that the indication for intervention is lowering to prevent the adverse consequences of longstanding pressure or volume overload. The type of intervention, now that we have catheter-based therapies, makes a more complex decision-making. And we've got a number of isolated other practical implications that have come out in the 2020 guidelines. Thank you very much for your attention.